loving father is gunned down just steps from his daughter's bedroom. An individual walked in the room, pulled a handgun out, and shot him. His girlfriend was in bed with him at the time. It was just unbelievable. And in such a ferocious way, too. It was horrific. Investigators search for a killer and uncover a deceitful past filled with possible suspects. They lived a lavish lifestyle. They always had boat, nice cars, nice houses. She believed that it was a Puerto Rican hit squad that came up to kill him. Or was the real danger much closer to home? His daughter said she had been a witness to a fight that her father and a neighbor had had earlier in the day. He said to me, I don't want to die. And I was like, why would you ever say that? He had asked her what to happen, and she said, you're better off if you don't know. All she could see was a figure, and she heard a click, and the shooter said, this is your lucky day. quiet night in Middleburg, New York, a small rural town nestled roughly 45 miles west of Albany. At 11.50 p.m., the peace is shattered when 911 operators receive a shocking call. A 911 call was made stating that uh, the subject had been shot. The call came from a neighbor of 31-year-old Nicole Braun. Nicole Braun said she had just witnessed the murder of her boyfriend, Frank Arroyo. She wasn't alone with Frank that night. She had Frank's 13-year-old daughter. His girlfriend, uh, who was in bed with him at the time, had uh, left the house in her nightgown. Nicole ran out of the house, and down the street, she ran to some neighbor's houses, and 911 was called. She said someone walked in the room, pulled a handgun out, and shot Frank, turned around, and walked out. With no time to lose, New York State troopers race to the scene. Upon arrival, they are met by Frank's 13-year-old daughter and his 31-year-old girlfriend, Nikki. His girlfriend, Nikki, was a bit hysterical. First responders, when they get there, they have to clear the house, make sure that this person left. They have to be sure that... Uh, the house is clear and safe. Troopers enter the home, checking each room before finding Frank. There was a victim shot multiple times. There was no pulse, no breathing, no heartbeat, uh, anything to indicate that he was alive at that point. The police found some uh, casings, some bullet casings, but other than the body and blood splatter, there was no evidence of a struggle. There was no evidence of a robbery or burglary. This was a straight out shooting and that was it. In a homicide like this, the background of the, of the victim becomes important. Who had a motive to hurt him? Who had a motive to kill him? To his family, Frank Arroyo always seemed larger than life. He was just awesome. He was just always making you laugh, always cracking a joke. Born in Puerto Rico in 1948, at age three, Frank moved to Queens with his parents and three sisters. My aunt got really sick. It was really good to talk to in New York, so they sold their chickens and their cows, and they all moved to New York. And they struggled a little bit, you know, they weren't wealthy, but they were very loving. Then when he graduated high school, he went to the Army. He was cool. He's a great guy. He loved life. Every skill, talented. Family was everything to Frank, and he couldn't wait to start one of his own. And in 1971, at the age of 23, he fell in love and married fellow Puerto Rican Gladys Rentas. My mom came from Puerto Rico also when she was three years old. Both of them ended up in Queens in the same building. My mom was a sweetheart. She was a doll. And my dad was funny. He was a prankster. I guess they were a little opposite of each other. Though Gladys had a six-month-old son from a previous marriage, Frank welcomed her child with open arms. 
and by 1977, they had grown to a family of five. I was born in 74, and then uh, Amy came along in 77. Frank embraced fatherhood and loved taking family adventures. My dad loved going camping, hiking, going to the beach. He always loved playing his music. He was always with his guitar and playing his songs. Family man. This kid's thought he was raising his kids. Take care of the family. It was his life. Frank worked as a handyman to make ends meet and eventually landed a job as a building superintendent. He told me to put up ceiling fans, installing air conditions, buffing the floors. Frank and Gladys seemed to have the pained when Frank met Donna Salerno, a spirited New Yorker, 11 years his junior. My dad was the superintendent of a building, and she worked for the management company that was in charge of the superintendents. There was a lot of flirting going on. Donna came into the picture. My first man, I told my sister, she's wild, bro. I'm like, she did what she want. They didn't care. She wanted to have fun. She's going to have fun. He was unfortunately so madly in love with Donna and taken by her for some reason. She tore her family apart. By 1982, Frank had divorced Gladys and married Donna. My mother was very resilient. It was hard for her. But she, she bounced back and she raised three kids. She did what she had to do. And she did, did it on her own. My mom and dad were fighting for custody of us. I wanted to go home to my mom. I was a little girl. Frank and Donna relocated to Florida, where they started a successful real estate venture. They were like selling properties. They were basically flipping, flipping properties. They lived a lavish lifestyle. They always had a boat, nice cars, nice houses. Frank and Donna eventually had a daughter and son of their own. And Frank loved getting all of his children together. We just visited them. We didn't live the everyday life with them. It was mostly fun whenever we got to see him. We didn't really see him much, not as much as I would have liked to. When the couple traveled to Puerto Rico for real estate ventures, they would bring the children along. We went to Puerto Rico with him a few times. I remember he told me how to do the merengue dance. In 1996, Frank and Donna's lavish life went up in smoke when they found themselves in legal hot water. Frank and his wife, Donna, had been involved in some sort of scam in Puerto Rico in regards to some phony mortgages. Donna and Frank were extradited from Sarasota, Florida, back to Puerto Rico and placed under arrest. Frank was in jail for a short period of time. That's when the marriage really went south when he got out of prison. Frank was released after seven months in prison, and shortly thereafter, he and Donna separated. He moved back to New York with the couple's 12-year-old daughter, while Donna and the couple's four-year-old son stayed in Florida. My dad ended up back upstate New York in Middleburg. He was coming around to our house a lot, Staten Island, thinking about moving there. So we were excited. I was just so happy that he was around again. By 1996, Frank and Donna's divorce was pending. There was Libby on a 40-foot yacht in Florida with her boyfriend, Carrie, and her five-year-old boy. My dad finally moved on. He finally met someone. He found a pretty girl that he was happy with. He would go to the house and play his guitar, and he was happy as could be. But Frank's third act is snuffed out in an instant when he is gunned down on May 12, 1997. While a forensic team searches for clues inside, New York State investigators speak with Frank's girlfriend, Nikki Braun. She just witnessed her boyfriend murdered before her eyes. She was extremely upset. Nikki said she was in bed with Frank, and Frank was on the phone with his mother at the foot of the bed, sitting up, and she noticed someone come in uh, through the bedroom door, which was backlit, so all she could see was a figure. And she heard a click, and the shooter said, this is your lucky day. At that point, she thought this was a joke, and I guess Frank did as well. And then she heard metal, which was the shooter 
pulling back the slide on the automatic and uh, chambering around and fired off four shots, which all of them hit Frank. Frank's daughter did hear the gunshots and came out of the bedroom to see what that was. An individual unknown to them shot Frank four times, three times in the chest and one time in the head, turned around and walked out. It's a haunting story, but investigators can't take it as gospel just yet. When you have a, a murder like this, pretty much everybody's a suspect. Coming up, investigators look into Frank's new girl. She just witnessed a homicide. Could she have set this up? And they uncover a number of dangerous enemies. He said he'd gotten into a fight that day about money. Frank that day that he didn't intend to repay him, and it was worth about $5,000. So they, they got into 
There was a bit of a tussle. When they ask John for his whereabouts at the time of Frank's murder, he tells them that he was at home all night with his girlfriend. John Giacomacus had a girlfriend named Tiffany. Tiffany gave John an alibi. and She said he was with her. But in any criminal investigation, the police are going to take everything sort of with a grain of salt. Others escort Nikki Braun and Frank's young daughter to the police station while investigators break the news to the rest of Frank's family. And I remember being asleep and my phone rang. And I remember just jumping out of bed and right away we were in shock. It was just unbelievable. And in such a ferocious way, too, he was murdered. Like, you know, they didn't shoot him once, they shot him multiple times. It was horrific. My mom and my older brother told me the news. They were like, it's your dad. And just obviously, I was, you know, upset. My little sister was in the house when it happened. She was only 13 at the time. So we went and got her. It was just heart wrenching, devastating. Next, investigators call Frank's estranged wife, 37-year-old Donna Arroyo, who had been visiting her mother in Yonkers three hours away. She is shocked to learn of the shooting. When we interviewed her, she said that uh, her relationship with Frank was pretty good. They just grew apart. She immediately denied any involvement in this. She just said she came up to visit her daughter and drove to Middleburg, tried to ask her daughter to come to Florida with her. She said her daughter, uh, by choice, did not want to go to Florida, did not want to leave with her, wanted to live with her father, Frank. Donna's statement supports what her daughter told police earlier, and she's able to provide an alibi for the shooting. Donna was pretty adamant that she's at her mom's during the homicide, and her mother did corroborate that. One of the key pieces of information was that the shooter was a male. We know this because Nikki heard him say, this must be your lucky day, and it was clearly a man's voice. When asked about John, Donna doesn't hold back. She was saying that John and Frank did not get along, and uh, she thought that John could possibly have been at the point who did it. When asked who else might want Frank dead, Donna says the list of Frank's enemies for which he did get arrested, but during that, he had made off with some significant money, and uh, she believed that it was a Puerto Rican hit squad that came up to kill Frank over the money that he owed him. Not only that, Donna claims that Frank recently became involved with the Puerto Rican drug trade. Because the shooting occurred without uh, another assault involved, without a burglary, police looked at possibility that this could be a drug hit, some other type of retaliation for some other activity that Frank may have been involved in. Coming up, did Frank's criminal past make him a target for murder? I don't want to disparage the dead, but Frank wasn't an angel. And later, bizarre details emerge about Frank and Donna's tumultuous relationship. Donna made the uh, relationship with Frank look a lot rosier than they were fighting over the daughter. Something had to be done with him. It's been 24 hours since 48-year-old Frank Arroyo was murdered in his Middleburg home. While awaiting forensic and autopsy results, investigators dig deeper into Donna's allegations about Frank's criminal past. I don't want to disparage the dead, but Frank wasn't an angel. I would describe Frank as a small-time drug dealer, drugs being marijuana, but nothing that would rise to this level of a drug deal going bad or murder someone over a couple ounces of marijuana. We also learned early on that Frank and Donna had been involved in some sort of scam in Puerto Rico in regards to some phony mortgages. However, investigators find nothing to connect Frank's murder to his time in Puerto Rico. We did look into a land scam in Puerto Rico, and they all came up dead ends uh, pretty quickly. On the evening of May 13th, detectives circle back to John Giacomacus, the neighbor that Frank argued with on the day of his death. John apparently didn't give a full statement the first time. 
That's not unusual in a criminal investigation, especially one where there's a killer still out in the public somewhere. John confirms that he argued with Frank on the day of his murder, but reveals he wasn't the only one. John gave the police information about a fight with Donna that Frank had had as well that day on the street. And he says she clearly knew that Frank had a new relationship and he was intending a evident quite early on that Donna was very unhappy about that. Donna feared that Frank was so-called abducting their daughter, and she did not want that to happen. John said Donna was just beside herself, I mean, swearing and yelling and expletives and, and threatening Frank's life. She was very, very angry at him. Donna kept repeating that she was going to have her husband Frank killed. John says that Donna eventually left. Unable to shake the incident, he called Donna later to check on her. He had asked her what's going to happen, and she said, you, you're, better off, you're better off if you don't know. He heard in the background a male voice saying, Frank's going to get his effing brains blown out. The call ended. He didn't hear from Donna again. When the police get information like what Giacomacus gave to them, they have to make the assessment whether was it just that he was being maybe afraid to come forward with everything at once, or was he trying to get the spotlight taken away from him and put on somebody else? Investigators turn to Frank's family for more insight, and they don't hold back when it comes to Donna. She wasn't a good person. She was cheating on him for forever, for the longest time. She was putting guys around the front of his face. She had him, like, under her spell. It was crazy. Frank's family says when they heard that Frank and Donna separated, it didn't come as a surprise. I stayed with him when he finally moved away from Florida, and he was upset, very upset, and said to me, I don't want to die. And I was like, why would you ever say that? He said, well, I don't trust her. She's very manipulative and calculating. He told me he thought Donna's going to kill him. He told me out. Like, I think she's going to try to kill me. It's clear to investigators that it's time to pay Donna a visit. On May 14th, two days after Frank's murder... Investigators track her down at her mother's house in Yonkers. We sent state police investigators there to the mother's home to interview Donna. Investigators confront Donna with her suspicions, and she shares some alarming new information about her estranged husband. Donna says she heard that Frank was jealous because she had a boyfriend. Donna believed Frank was putting a hit out on Karen. She said Frank was connected to different things and he had to connect to save her boyfriend's life she hired two men to teach frank a lesson she said i didn't tell him to shoot him i told him to just come up and come up a little bit despite donna's stated intent someone did kill frank that night however donna stopped short of naming her accomplices she was arrested for criminal facilitation based on what we knew at the time. She was subsequently transported back up north to Middlebrook, New York, where she was uh, remanded to the Scary County Jail. Just as investigators begin looking into Donna's past associates, a call comes in that blows the case wide open. The command post received a call from an attorney out of uh, Orlando, Florida. He said, I have a client here in my office that was there. He did not take part in it, and uh, he's looking for immunity. But he can tell you who did it and how it all happened. Coming up, who really killed Frank Arroyo? I think he was in love with Donna, but realized he had been manipulated. She convinced him that the only way around it was that uh, Frank had to die. And later, shocking details emerge about the master plan. She said, now remember how I told you to do it. I wanted to make it look like a Puerto Rican hit. After 
Frank Arroyo's estranged wife is arrested for facilitation of murder. New York State investigators receive a tip about a potential informant in Florida, Donna's home state. We uh, enlisted the help of the FBI and the FDLE, Department of Law Enforcement. Within 24 hours, New York State investigators touch down in Florida and set up a meeting with the attorney and his client, a frightened man named Steve Hannum. Steve was horrified in what had happened. His words, he started to name names, in particular Donna's boyfriend, Kerry McKinley, and Daniel Edwards as being the participants in the murder. Steve says he and Kerry worked together at a refrigeration company. Steve knew a little bit about Kerry's relationship with Donna and knew that they had gotten engaged. Kerry said he had to take a few days off to go to New York to settle some affairs that he had going on up there with his work. He said, I've never been to New York. I'd like to see it. On May 11th, 1997, Steve arrived to pick Kerry up. On the way out of town, Kerry said, listen, my, my half-brother, Daniel, is going to come with us too. Is that all right? He goes, sure. He can share the driving and et cetera. He picked up Kerry McKinley's half-brother, Daniel Edwards, and the three of them drove nonstop from Florida to New York. Steve said that McKinley was getting phone calls from Don Arroyo stating that things had gone sour, that uh, she was fighting with her ex-husband. Steve says they arrived in New York on the evening of May 12th. The three of them got a motel room about 40 minutes from Middleburg. And then Donna shows up about a half hour after they're at this hotel. And that's when Steve meets Donna for the first time. And she's telling Carrie that Frank had been abusive, that they were fighting over the daughter. Something had to be done with him. And she wanted Carrie to go in, up to Middleburg and to beat him. According to him, he wasn't privy to a lot of the conversations because they would go into a different room. As the night wore on, uh, they said, we're going back to Frank's house. And since Steve had rented the car, he said, I'll drive. The idea when they got there was for Carrie to go in and confront Frank. And he was supposed to intimidate him to leave Don alone, to let her take the daughter, Jamie, back to Florida. But Steve says on the drive over, everything changed. And that's when the guns came out, in particular the forty caliber said that Carrie had handed it to his half-brother Daniel and Donna said, now remember how I told you to do it, shoot him in the head, I want it to make look like a Puerto Rican hit. Steve tells investigators when he realized what was going on, he felt sick. When he was driving, he got so upset he couldn't drive and uh, Carrie took over the wheel. According to Steve, once they arrived at Frank's house, Daniel got out of the car and went to the house with the gun. The three of them went and drove away and drove around the block once or twice. And eventually, once they came around, Daniel was out front by this time. And he got in the car and they asked him what happened. He said that it's all done. I took care of it. Steve says the four of them then went their separate ways. Carrie McKinley and Donna Arroyo went to Yonkers. And Steve and Daniel drove back together in the rented car to Florida. Steve tells investigators as he and Daniel crossed the Hudson River, they made a pit stop. Daniel said to Steve, slow down, pull over, I'm going to throw the gun out. The Hudson, it's a few miles wide, big current. There's no way you're going to put divers into that kind of situation. Daniel was uh, calm, cool, and collected, according to Steve. They drove back, uh, straight back down to Florida and just parted ways immediately. Now, investigators need to determine if Steve really was an unwitting witness or is he just trying to save himself within a week of the murder they go down to Florida and they find Daniel Edwards Steve told us where we might find Carrie and Daniel we actually went to a work location that Daniel was doing an HVAC install when we arrived at the convenience store to arrest Daniel he made a spontaneous statement uh, I was expecting you guys to Authorities locate Carrie next. We arrested Carrie at a, in his motel room where he was residing in Florida. Both men are arrested 
and taken to a temporary field office where they are separated and interviewed. First, he tells investigators he met Donna in Florida only six months earlier. She was there near a job site that he was working at, and they became friends, and then next thing you know, they became lovers. Carrie says Donna always told him that her ex was dangerous. Donna provided him with a lot of information that concerned him, to say the least, that Frank was going to abduct the 13-year-old daughter and take her away. She wanted Carrie to come to New York, intimidate Frank, scare him, and try to force him into allowing the daughter to go with her. Carrie admits that he asked his friend Steve and his half-brother Daniel to come along. But when they got to New York, things spiraled out of control. She told Carrie that Frank had ordered a hit, in other words, a contract on Carrie's life. She was saying the only way you can get out from underneath that contract is uh, that he has to be killed. Carrie says he had brought his 40 caliber handgun for protection. Carrie did everything but pull the trigger. He was up to his ears in this. He just couldn't do it. Carrie tells investigators his friend Steve is completely innocent. Carrie's interview was substantiating what Steve had told us, that he had no part in the planning of what they actually did. Next up, investigators speak with Carrie's half-brother, 26-year-old Daniel Edwards. He said he wanted to watch his brother's back, and uh, he was led to believe there was an actual hit on his brother, Carrie. Donna convinced him couldn't do it or wouldn't do it, but uh, Daniel said, I'll take care of it, I'll do it. He was just there for the ride and there to pull the trigger and didn't get too emotional about the whole thing. Pretty cool. According to Daniel, on the night of May 12, 1997, they drove to Frank's house with one intention. After Daniel shot Frank, Donna said, did you do it as I told you? And he said, yes, I think I shot him twice. I, I, I can't remember. Everybody in the car said Donna was happy, relieved, like a weight off her shoulders. After Daniel and Carrie's interviews, Steve is officially cleared of any wrongdoing. We felt that uh, he was there solely as an unwitting participant and would be better served as a witness. Carrie McKinley and Daniel Edwards are charged with murder and transported back to New York. Donna's charge of facilitation is officially bumped up to murder in the first degree. Once you arrest someone for murder, the work doesn't end there. In fact, you got to put as much effort into the prosecution and proving it, and beyond a reasonable doubt. As predicted, the murder weapon is never found. However, investigators are able to verify that Carrie purchased a 40 caliber firearm March 2nd, 1997, just two months before Frank was killed. We did a search warrant on his 40-foot Bayliner boat, which was essentially his residence, and we found a 40 caliber ammunition. We didn't find anything of relevance other than ammunition. Investigators find no evidence that Frank was abusive toward Donna, or that he had taken out a hit on her new man. There was a lie. I don't think there was any thought in Frank's mind to kill anybody. And Carrie believed it, because... He was in Donna's web. Coming up, more details emerge about Donna's deadly scheme. Money had been mentioned that Donna would give them $100,000 each from life insurance. And one of the alleged killers walks free. I thought that was disgusting. I don't think any of them should have gotten off. State investigators have charged Donna Arroyo, Carrie McKinley, and Daniel Edwards for their roles in the murder of 48 year old Frank Arroyo. With trials, she pled guilty to murder in the second degree that took off the table her going to trial and being convicted of murder in the first degree. 
custody can be and is a motivating factor to crime. And in this particular case, I think, led Donna to have her husband killed. She knew what she was doing, and she had a mission, and she was going to see that mission through, and she did. Donna concedes that she had even offered the brothers a share of her husband's life insurance policy as payment. Money had been mentioned that Donna would give them $100,000 each from life insurance, which there was no life insurance that we're aware of. Donna was giving them lies and false information. Donna is sentenced to 25 years to life. 25 years to life, which means after serving your 25 years minimum, you'd be eligible for parole. I don't feel like justice was served, to be honest, because she gets to come out and enjoy her children. My dad didn't get to see his children grow up. Daniel Edwards pled guilty to murder in the second degree uh, for intentionally killing Frank Arroyo. Daniel Edwards is also sentenced to 25 to life. They think that he's a terrible, horrible person, and I wish he would have got more time also. As for Donna's boyfriend, Kerry, in November of 1998, he takes his chances at trial. He was charged with conspiracy in the second degree, criminal possession of a weapon in the second degree as, a, as an aider and a better. His lawyer was crying, saying his man, his guy, his client was innocent. He didn't know what Donna was going to do. Kerry takes the stand and renounces his earlier confession with law enforcement. Not only that, but Kerry denies being in the car during the crime and says the murder weapon wasn't even his. Since we don't have the gun, we couldn't prove it either way. And on December 7th, 1998, the jury comes back with a shocking verdict. Not guilty. I was disappointed, to say the least. I think one of the contributing factors to Carrie's acquittal was the fact that the jury did not think much of Donna's credibility, and they were placing most of the blame on Donna. I thought that was disgusting. I thought that they should have all been held accountable for what they did. I don't think any of them should have gotten off. The sad thing about this is the kids lost both the mother and the father, one going to prison for 25 to life and the other being dead. Roughly 25 years later, in the spring of 2022, Donna is released on parole, along with her co-conspirator, Daniel. It's horrible. It's not fair, you know. He's he's gone, and she gets to walk around. She gets to go come out now and, and stay with her daughter and her son and meet the grandkids and live this happy life at only 60-something years old, and my dad never got that. How was that justice? In spite of everything, his daughters do their best to keep their dad's memory alive. He's going to be remembered by... He was just so happy-go-lucky. He was so fun to be around. He was always singing with his guitar and just the life of the party. He was so kind, and he was just a great guy, and he didn't deserve to go out like that. Think of him often. We do get together every year for a family reunion in his memory to honor him. He was a handsome private investigator living a life of escapades and intrigue. He scored the highest IQ test in the whole Western Seaboard of the Army. He had a gift for talking with people. He had the ability to get them to open up to him. Then he disappeared. 
disappeared without a trace. It's as if he just walked out the door and poof, vanished into thin air. In their hunt for the missing businessman, investigators sort through several leads. She was his biggest client, providing the bulk of the company's monthly income. He worked on issues related to the Mexican drug cartel. So there's some dangerous territory in his line of work. But as more layers begin to unfold, an unexpected cast of characters reveal themselves. We received a phone call. She had a client who had information about a kidnap and murder. He was putting himself out there as a cartel hitman. She accessed highly sensitive, confidential information and gave it to the KGB. The hidden microphones that were up near his shoulders. So when she leaned in to whisper that to him, it couldn't have been more loud and clear. It's a It's August 21st, 1998 in San Diego, California. 16-year-old Ian Post is at the home he shares with his father, Rick, when the phone rings. The secretary in my father's office called and said, hey, have you seen your father? Ian tells her he hasn't seen his dad in 24 hours. And so, obviously, I tried calling my father. I'm not getting an answer. So that started to worry me. Ian is well aware that his father's work as a private investigator sometimes requires him to leave town at the last minute. But he also knows that Rick never leaves without telling him. He would be making preparations that I was going to be with a possible family member or a friend, someone that we trusted, but that was never set up. Rick didn't tell his 16-year-old boy that he was going any place. Took no clothes, took no medications with him. That's not a normal business trip. That's suspicious. It's as if he just walked out the door and poof, vanished into thin air. Ian Rick's car was parked in front of his house. And the keys to the car were left in the mailbox. Ian reaches out to other family members and finds no one else has seen or heard from 52-year-old Rick Post in over 24 hours either. His family, his kids, were concerned because they hadn't heard a word from him and that was not like him. It was a huge red flag. I always knew where he was. I knew something bad had happened. We were doing everything that we could to figure out where he was. On September 2nd, 1945, Rick Post was a native Californian. He was born and raised in San Diego. He entered the Army Intelligence back when he was 18. He scored the highest IQ test in the whole Western Seaboard of the Army. So they immediately put him into Army Intelligence. Rick served during the Vietnam War and specialized in radio communications. My father being in the Army at a young age was very well-traveled. This took him to places like Turkey, Germany, all over Europe. By his late 20s, Rick was out of the army and married. In 1971, his first son, Orion, is born. And 10 years later, in 1981, he has a second son, Ian. We had a sailboat growing up. We spent a lot of time out in the ocean. That was something that gave me a, a lot of happiness. To support his growing family, Rick drew on his military background and opened a private investigation firm. So my father's company was called Intellisource, based out of Old Town San Diego, and the type of work ranged anywhere from local investigation to cheating investigation of a spouse or husband, and anything in between. Rick wasn't afraid to take on difficult or even dangerous cases. He had worked on a case for a woman in uh, Ocean Beach, San Diego. Her son was murdered by, uh, by a cult named the Rainbow Children. He worked on issues related to the Mexican cartel. So there's some dangerous territory in his line of work. Rick had a 
gift for talking with people. He had the ability to, uh, in the moment, relate to someone and get them to open up to him. In his line of work, it is a talent that you can't buy. Rick's work life was a success, but his love life was a different story. By the late 90s, Rick was twice divorced with four kids. I lived between two different homes, so, you know, I would visit with my father, I'd visit with my mother, but it was always that. By the late 90s, business was thriving so much that Rick took on a protege. He hired an aspiring young PI, John Kruger. John Kruger worked in my father's office maybe about a year and a half. John had wanted to get his own license. In 1997, Rick landed his most prominent client yet, millionaire Kimberly Bailey. Born in Oklahoma, Kimberly was raised in the quaint town of Stillwater. Kimberly was somewhat enigmatic. She was seemingly a loner. The only thing we know about her private life is that she came from an apparently very troubled childhood in Oklahoma. She traveled the world looking for endangered medicinal plants. Kimberly Bailey bought a, a ranch in Fallbrook, California, with the stated intent to use it as a place to grow natural medicines that she was uh, gathering from all over the world. It was beautiful. You know, 33 acres of avocado trees everywhere, a nice big ranch house. She was very pretty, highly intelligent. Kimberly also had a second business selling cutting-edge medical devices. She had a business known as Astropulse. And the idea was that uh, by using electrical currents, you could cure pretty much anything. Astropulse was a black box that had some controls and dials on them. The user would hold in. The box would send electric currents to your body. By 1997, Kimberly was in her early 40s and had amassed a sizable fortune. She was this Zen, holistic practitioner who made a lot of money. Business was outstandingly successful. The word of mouth would spread. And uh, she had many, many, many people ordering her black box. She built up hundreds of thousands of dollars. But Kimberly worried that those closest to her were trying to undo what she had built. Kim was rather paranoid. She always believed that somebody was watching her or after her. She thought that some of her employees were stealing from her. So Kimberly Bailey hired Rick Post to conduct investigations. Rick enlisted his new right-hand man, John Kruger, to help in the case. Rick worked closely with Kimberly. The suave PI and beautiful businesswoman made an instant connection. She was his biggest client, providing the bulk of the company's monthly income, like nature. But after a short and passionate fling, Rick decided it was best to steer clear of anything serious. I do remember my father telling me at our home, that he wanted to keep this relationship professional, that he did not want to have a romantic relationship with her. Despite the brush-off, Kimberly and Rick maintained their professional relationship. With the holistic guru as one of his most prominent clients, Rick seems to be in his professional prime. Until the P.I. suddenly vanishes on August 20th, 1998, throwing his family into a panic. All of his belongings he would take with him were there at the house. So that alone itself was something that triggered, you know, kind of an emergency response. Over the course of that week, my brother and I had been looking for him. We had been contacting the airlines. I don't think I slept at all, really, that first week. Then his son Ian gets a troubling phone call from John Kruger. John Kruger says, uh, we got this voicemail here at the office. I think you should hear it. Okay, I'll be right over. He plays it for me. The voicemail was Rick's voice. 
and was directed to his office staff saying that he was going to be in Mexico for a few days. Yeah, he was fine not to worry about him. The voicemail was left the day before Rick went missing. John feels confident that the message means Rick is okay. But Ian and other family members have their doubts. It really wasn't what my father was saying. It was his candor, the way he spoke. His voice sounded worried, forced, coerced. It did not sound like a natural thing. They all knew something was very wrong. With concerns mounting, Rick's family files a missing persons report in August 1998. Missing person investigations can be uh, very intense. The longer someone stays disappeared, the greater the chances that they will never be found. Coming up, police locate the last known person to be seen with the missing PI. She and Rick Post had gone down to Mexico for a work trip. She dropped him off at the airport, and then she drove back. This seems really weird. And just as local... She said she had a client who had information about a kidnap and murder. She was asking for blanket immunity for her client. I didn't know if I was going to ever hear anything further. 
regarding this. It just was possible that no one would ever do. By January of 1999, Rick has been missing for over four months, and the Post family is beginning to lose hope. Then, out of the blue, FBI agents at a field office in San Diego, California, get an unexpected phone call. We received a phone call from the U.S. Attorney's Office about an attorney named Colleen Cusack, who said she had a client who had information about a kidnap and murder, a person from San Diego. Before she will reveal the name of the victim, Colleen attempts to negotiate a deal for her client. She was asking for a blanket immunity for her client in order to discuss the matter. The United States Attorney's Office does not generally offer blanket immunity to people up front without hearing what they have to say. So that conversation never went anywhere. The phone call ends abruptly, but agents follow up with San Diego police. We started reviewing some of the missing persons files at the San Diego Police Department. We had a few facts that they did get from this initial phone call at a certain date and time, and it matched up with the missing persons report uh, of Rick Post disappearing in Mexico. After that, there were ongoing negotiations where the U.S. Attorney's Office was trying to get Ms. Cusack to bring her client in and explain what they knew, but that also never materialized. After hitting yet another dead end, in May of 1999, FBI agents circle back to Rick's employee, John Kruger. He asked us if he could call his attorney and talk to her before answering our questions. So said, of course. He then said, my attorney would call in Cusack. At that point, we quickly made the connection that Rick Post is not just a missing person. Rick was murdered. And John Kruger has information directly related to the kidnap and murder of Rick Post. But whatever John knows, he isn't willing to share. He would not talk with us, but definitely raised our level of suspicion into his role in this case. Investigators turn back to the other person of interest in this case, Kimberly Bailey. As it turns out, Kimberly already has her own file at the FBI. We saw it. We had an open investigation on her related to her company, Astropulse. She was claiming that these were medical devices that cured cancer. Could Kimberly's fraudulent business dealings be linked to Rick's disappearance? The investigation had kind of come to a standstill. They started conducting a surveillance of the ranch that Kimberly Bailey owned up in Fallbrook. Kimberly Bailey did exhibit a lot of odd behaviors. She did not like talking on the phone. She preferred to meet people in person, would often speak in a whisper, as though she thought or feared she was being surreptitiously recorded somehow. She had that kind of paranoid mindset. They knew that in addition to Kimberly, there were, there were some other people living in there. So the case agents finally decided, let's go up and talk to people up there and see what we can find out. Coming up, investigators find themselves seeking help from an international spy. It was like something right out of a James Bond movie. And an undercover sting reveals a horrifying plot. Torture included hitting him in the face and crushing his fingers with pliers. agents in San Diego suspect that private investigator Rick Post was kidnapped and murdered in Mexico. There are two names in his missing persons file that have garnered their attention. John Kruger and Kimberly Bailey. Usually in an investigation, you try and talk to your main subjects last. You want to have as much information as possible when you go into that interview, because then it allows you to know if what they're telling you is false. In November of 19 leads, agents pay a visit to Kimberly's Fallbrook Avocado 
Ranch. When they arrive, they're greeted by two employees, husband and wife, Bruce and Svetlana. This woman identified herself as Svetlana Olga Rodnikova. This moment was a jaw dropper for the agents. Svetlana was someone that is known to virtually every FBI agent who joined the agency during the 1980s and 1990s. Back in the early 80s, an agent in Los Angeles by the name of Richard Miller, he was working counterintelligence against the Soviets. And Svetlana, she'd been used as a source in those cases. And they became intimate. Svetlana, like something right out of a James Bond movie, seduced an FBI agent, accessed highly sensitive confidential information, and gave it to the KGB. Svetlana was sentenced to 18 years, uh, served nine, and after that was in danger of losing her status to stay in the United States. And in fact, uh, one step ahead of INS essentially moved back to Mexico. While down there, came into contact with Kimberly. Agent's doctor he explained why they were there, why they were there looking for Kimberly. Yes, well, we're investigating the Rick Post murder, and can we talk to you? And Lana and I looked at each other, you know, because here's the FBI, she's here illegally, and reporting as if she was still in Mexico. Svetlana tells the agents that Kimberly is away at a yoga retreat. She also says that she and Bruce have been working and living at Kimberly's ranch for around six months. In that time, they forged a friendship with the quirky millionaire. On the surface, she's brilliant, she's pretty, a little bit paranoid. She thought the satellites were listening to her and that people were after her. However, Svetlana claims Kimberly trusted her. One day, she began confiding in her about her breakup with Rick Post. She was a woman scorned. She was in love with Rick. He dropped her as a girlfriend. The real problem was jealousy. What's more, Kimberly told Svetlana money was missing from her business. That she believed that Rick Post was stealing money from her. This was the one-two punch that sent her over the edge. And then Svetlana says Kimberly revealed her that she had orchestrated the kidnap and murder of Rick Post. The problem that we had was we didn't see a way that we would be able to use information or testimony coming from a former convicted espionage agent. How do we get around that? They solved it by getting uh, Svetlana to agree to wear a wire recording device. I think she was scared of Kimberly, and I think there was a fear motive in her status in the United States. She was actually back in the United States illegally. A few weeks later, Kimberly asks Svetlana to pick her up from the airport in Phoenix and drive her back to California. The nine-hour car ride presents the perfect opportunity. Our agents wired up the car in advance, also wired Svetlana up with hidden recording devices. It takes a little prompting from Svetlana to get Kimberly talking. Kimberly says that John Kruger had called her in August 1998 with some concerning information about his boss, Rick Post. She had been told by Kruger that Post had been taking her money and then sleeping with other women. She was so enraged that she just had to prove a lesson to him. Kimberly reveals that she asked John Kruger to help her hire some muscle. John had become acquainted with an individual by the name of Humberto Uribe national who was purporting to have connections to the cartel kimberly paid 25 year old umberto approximately forty thousand dollars and then lured rick post to mexico on august 20th the trap was set kimberly went down to mexico with rick post they stopped at a pharmacy rick waited in the car kimberly got out of the car 
supposedly to go to the pharmacy. The two men hired by Uribe approached the car, forced Rick out of the car, and took him away. After Richard is kidnapped, Kimberly gets inside of Richard's car, turns around, and heads back to San Diego, where she drops off his car at his own home. Once they had Rick posed in Tijuana, Uribe forced him to make the call that the family heard, where he said, don't worry about me, I'm in Mexico City. According to Kimberly, Humberto and his two associates tortured Rick for the next five days. He duct taped to a chair, and then he took some pliers. Rick was kidnapped. Kimberly Bailey said she continued to travel back down to Mexico to the safe house where he was being kept to observe his torture. After five days of torture, Rick still hadn't confessed to stealing from her. Rick, did I admit that I slept with other women? He always denied stealing anything. Kimberly tells Svetlana that she told Uribe to build an underground prison and keep him there for the rest of his life. It's a, it's a dangerous forest. We don't like staying up all night watching these die. <laughs> that she is sharing her story with her because she needs her help. She asked uh, on if she knew anybody, any hitmen who she could hire to kill John Kruger and kill Humberto Uribe. Svetlana, to her credit, rolled with it. Took it right in stride and said, yeah, she, she did know somebody. So the decision was made, let's put a bow on this. Kimberly Bailey wants a hitman. So the FBI decided, we'll give her a hit man. Coming up, agents set up a sting. So she bent over me and whispered in my ear for an hour. And learn of her next plan for bloodshed. She would have been literally the last person standing in the room with a bloody knife. with former KGB spy Svetlana Algorodnikova. Not only did Kim lay out the entire scenario uh, and her involvement, Kruger's involvement, Iribe's involvement with the kidnap and murder, she also approached Svetlana for help in eliminating Kruger and Iribe. She was going down a road where she would have been literally the last person standing in the room with a bloody knife. Svetlana agrees to work with investigators once again, almost a year and a half since Rick's disappearance. Svetlana worked with us to help set up a meeting between Kimberly Bailey and who she thought was a hitman that Svetlana was connected to. So a meeting was arranged in a hotel room. Fortunately for us, the professional hitman was in fact a professional FBI agent. Agent Nick McKean takes on the role of hitman. Before I met with her, I talked with Svetlana about uh, Kim Bailey and just asked her what kind of person she was, what could I expect her to do. We wired up the hotel and Kimberly Bailey and the FBI undercover agent met to discuss Kim's request. When she arrives, it's clear that Kimberly's infamous paranoia is in full swing. I think she was a little skittish. And what I wanted to do was put her at ease, make her feel like uh, I was the guy that she would want to hire. Kimberly refuses to talk about the hits. Instead, she pulls a laptop computer out of her bag. Kimberly tries to type out the death wish 
and the lab does not work. Since she can't type her request, Kimberly is forced to say it out loud. And so she bent over me and, and whispered in my ear for an hour. The irony is, when she leaned in to, to whisper that to him, it couldn't have been more loud and clear. Kimberly reveals that her hit list has changed since she spoke to Svetlana. Only one name remains the same. She wanted three people killed. She wanted John Kruger, she wanted her attorney, and then she wanted her gardener. And I, for the life of me, I couldn't get her to just tell me why she wanted her gardener killed. Still don't know. Kimberly is clear that the murders should not look like intentional killings. I told her it will stage an accident. You know, something violent will happen to them, they will die. Kimberly gave the undercover agent $10,000 as a down payment. FBI agents are able to secure arrest warrants for Kimberly and her co-conspirators. Unfortunately, at the time that we had the operation ready to go, uh, John Kruger was the only person in the country, and he was arrested first. On April 4th of 2000, John Kruger is arrested in San Diego. Court in Mexico City. Armed with 14 pieces of luggage and a Canadian ID, it's clear that she's on the run. Kimberly Bailey was later arrested at an airport in Mexico and extradited to the United States. Kimberly refuses to talk and maintains her innocence. Meanwhile, Humberto Uribe remains free in Mexico. He is a Mexican national. It oftentimes can take a long time to extradite someone from Mexico to the United States when there is a murder case. Prosecutors begin preparing for Kimberly's trial. In addition to Svetlana, they are able to secure another star witness. John Kruger was the first to plead guilty to conspiracy to commit kidnapping and offer cooperation to the government. John tells investigators that it all started when he became upset with Rick for not paying him what he felt he deserved. John Kruger's a bit of a disgruntled employee at the company. He's only making $15 an hour. He sees that Richard Post is reeling in the dough. So John lied and told Kimberly Rick was stealing from her. It was actually John Kruger who dripped the first poison in Kimberly Bailey's ear. Knowing how paranoid Kimberly Bailey was, knowing that this would enrage her. When Kimberly asked him to help her find a hitman, he obliged. John Kruger orchestrated this plot to get rid of Rick Post so that John could take over the business. Between John and Svetlana, the case against Kimberly is strong. But prosecutors will soon learn that Kimberly Bailey's will to remain free may be even stronger. Kimberly is fight to the death. And it just seems so natural for her to say, I'm not making any deal with anybody. I'm going to trial because she thinks she's impenetrable. Coming up, a shocking claim rocks the courtroom. Rick wasn't dead. He was living off her money somewhere in Mexico. And the twists keep coming. You could say that that is the ultimate Hollywood movie ending to a twisted story like this. An entrepreneur is accused of orchestrating the kidnapping, torture, and murder of her one-time lover and private investigator, Rick Post. For Rick's family, it's been four years since they last saw him, and the trial has been a long time coming. When the court cases happened, it took over again, and we had to relive it again to listen to the horrible details of what they did to my father. It was, you know, pretty horrific. Prosecutors 
Prosecutors argue that Rick's murder was driven by a deadly combination of revenge and paranoia. He was tortured in an effort to get him to cough up a confession on stealing money from her. Unfortunately, it appears the problem for Rick was he hadn't stolen any money from her, so he had nothing to confess to. On the stand, Svetlana and John walk the jury through Kimberly's cold-hearted scheme. But Kimberly's attorneys argue that not only are these witnesses unreliable, but Rick Post is still alive. Kim Bailey's position through the entire trial was that Rick wasn't dead. That Rick stole a lot of money from her, and he was living off her money somewhere in Mexico. In July, the jury finds Kimberly Bailey guilty of kidnapping. But without a body, they deadlock on the murder charge. When it came to the murder, even though we know she said a million times she wanted to kill, there was no body. Kimberly fires her attorney and represents herself at her sentencing on the kidnapping conviction. Never a good move. That's probably the worst type of representation you can have. Kimberly receives a life plus 10 years in prison. John Kruger is rewarded for his cooperation. After John Kruger pled guilty, the judge saw fit to sentence him to, to 12 years in prison. I think 12 years was laughable. John kicked this whole thing off, blamed to my father, saying that he had stolen money. He knew the type of person that he was telling this to. It takes five more years for the third perpetrator of the crime, hitman Umberto Iribe, to face justice. He got popped in Mexico for extradition to bring him back up to the United States to uh, face trial. Rick Post murder. He got 25 years. Is that long enough for taking a human life? I don't think so. Umberto's trial marks the end of a long and painful chapter for the Post family. We had a memorial service for my father, and we put a plaque down, and we had a ceremony for him. So that was for us, being able to kind of help us to move on. In 2008, Kimberly Bailey was diagnosed with cancer in prison. She refused any medical treatment and insisted on only using one of her Astropulse black box devices to, to treat her cancer. And she died in 2008. You could say that that is the ultimate Hollywood movie ending to a twisted story like this. The sad thing is a father was murdered never came home to his son or the rest of his family. There's so much more to him. You know, the man, his work, his craft, his care for his children, ultimate family man. He was my father and he was my best friend.